So if you were to ask a system for all of the rows in partition XYZ, they're already contiguous in storage. That is a key realization that you need to build the fastest data models you can build. And that the clustering determines the structure of the storage. So that carries forward if we go down into the structure. If we were to provide a ranged qualifier on where, say where bar is, well, these are not in the right order, are they? Let's reverse yellow and red. Now our example matches the storage order. So if we were to say where bar greater than red and bar bar greater than or equal to red and bar less than or equal to yellow, we implicitly have a ranged access that can just read the storage system. From this point to that point, there's no skipping, there's no random seeks after you get to the entry point. And that's an efficient range read. So because of that property, because the CQL language kind of enforces that access pattern, you can build some very high performance time series Okay. You said the structure itself is dynamic, right? The table structure. So the storage level of Cassandra is a little different than the user level. With Thrift, they were kind of one and the same, and that made things complicated because people had to think about the storage. Now with CQL and having the ability to control things through the primary key structure, you don't have to think about storage level. As long as you know what I just showed you, as long as you know that the efficient range works that way, then you can kind of encode that in, in your practice by just knowing that it works that way instead of having to. But the data at the storage level, the data is fully dynamic. So is there a way to change primary? You cannot dynamically change a primary. You can create another view. You can create a materialized view and access that, or if you need to make your primary entry point. For synchronous operations, then you can make it on the table. Let's say, for example, I'm dealing with a lot of um, data, and I know it's kind of it's like I'm taking it. Uh, I've got Jason coming out. Um, do I have to sit there and actually kind of design a model with Cassandra or with Cassandra, Cassandra um, uh, digest that Jason and say, here's a suggested model for you? Well, that's a good question. The first, the first question I heard was, how does it handle JSON? How does it handle model dynamics? So Cassandra does support JSON now. It's something that we debated quite a bit about before we decided it's a good idea. But it makes integration with mobile apps and things like that much easier. We also have a, a, a compromise between a full dynamics system and type of structure in terms of the data model, which is something called user-defined types. User-defined types are exactly what they sound like. <coughs> in terms of a structure, you can basically create a struct in your data model and reuse it, and you have dot accessors for the fields and things like that. That means that you can create some division of structure that represents the, the different uh, patterns in your JSON and use JSON to access and modify these. So it will not suggest to you what a data model would be, and to do that intelligently, of course, you would need to know a lot about the access factors. But you have the ability to intentionally design some division of units of your JSON structure and make them into user-defined types. Yes? There's uh, something I read about typing that right now it's like second um, after Neo4j. The question is, what's the benefit? Like, is it, wouldn't there be like almost like a third layer of a data structure that more like a data database on top so of it? So typing. Because I'm looking into a graph, right? Yeah. Obviously, Cassandra is not the solution, and 
Uh, now we have to look at other ideas. Neo4j is out of the question in terms of like production and scalability. Do you have a single one super the right off? <laughs> so tell me more about that. Since uh, data so, is I'll give you some context on Python and, and how that relates to data sets. So, Python is the open source operational transactional graph database. Yeah. It's one of the, the only ones out there to really embrace the hard problems of the dealing with graph and also dealing with the complex query on graph distributed across lots of nodes in the open source world. So DataStax acquired I think Aurelius and Matias and his team are now working for us to building what we will call DataStax or DataStax Enterprise Graph. Some, something like that. We are also supporting OSS SQL system. So the OSS community with graph by Basically saying yes, we want to support type. We're going to provide a major release of type and tinker pop and all the tools that work. That's good for everybody who needs operational and transactional graph. With our first type, it's going to be supported in DSE. I can't remember exactly which parts I'm allowed to talk about and which I'm not, but I can tell you that essentially it's going to be the same base functionality plus some additional things that make it work better with Cassandra and things like that. So, um, we're still working on it. I can't tell you, I can't tell you because I don't know when, when we're going to release it. But if you are very familiar with the Tinkerpop tools and you use that on Titan right now, then you should have a familiar experience using the using graph as well. Did that answer your question? That's, that's fair enough. Okay. Just to be clear on Titan and the DSC graph, they are different than a lot of graph systems. Like they're not GraphX. GraphX is more analytical, right? You use it with Spark. An operational graph store is kind of an unfamiliar thing for those that don't really have any for it. Say this is what I need. When you have that need and you go looking for it, you find Titan. And we think that, that graph databases are a big part of our future. So we will be spending some time helping adopters understand what's a good fit for an operational graph store versus something like Cassandra Pure. Because once you go from the pseudo structure view of CQL to graph, you basically take off all of the limitations of blinders about uh, geographic growth of operations and structure and things. So there, there are lots of algorithmic trade-offs to deal with. That's going to be one of our most important challenges going forward. Any other questions? We have just a minute or two. Okay, so if anybody has any other questions or just wants to chat, I'll be around for the next hour or two hours maybe. Yeah. All right, thanks.